welcome to ECFR's debate on how the uh, EU should navigate the world in which uh, economic coercion has become a common practice. This is a public debate, so please feel free to tweet about it, tell your friends and family, and if you have questions, just uh, put them uh, in the chat. Thanks a lot also for choosing this uh, event over, over an Euro Cup match between Ukraine and North Macedonia, um, which is happening as we speak. Uh, let me um, welcome our guests, uh, Professors uh, Abraham Newman and Henry Farrell from Georgetown University and John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, respectively, uh, are authors of the book on the uses and abuses of weaponized interdependence. And they are also pioneers um, in the analysis of the economic coercion. We also have Erika Moret uh, hello, uh, from the Graduate Institute in Geneva, who is a leading expert on, on sanctions and sanctions policy. And also uh, my colleague, Jonathan uh, hacken uh, who heads ECFR's task force for strengthening Europe against economic coercion. My name is Pavel Zerka, I'm policy fellow at uh, ECFR. Uh, we've got only one hour for this discussion, so we need to be very disciplined. Uh, Abby and Henry, uh, directly uh, to you, could you perhaps set uh, the scene and uh, tell us a little bit what weaponized interdependence, the concept that you've been analyzing, actually means and why this is an issue today? Can you start this screen? Wonderful. Okay, so this is uh, what we want to do. We want to talk very quickly about what we think about what Europe is facing in a world of what we have to think as weapon interdependence. And very, very quickly through some of the ideas that we and what we think the consequences are. Uh, next slide. So, uh, we used to think about globalization, as Thomas Friedman put it, not a wall, uh, not a, but as a web. And here what he was referring to was the idea that after the Cold War was over, after the Berlin Wall had fallen, we were going to be in a world that was going to be reunited together uh, by a web, by the World Wide Web, but also by this broader web of global economic and information and financial and production networks that were going to weave the world together into a single marketplace in which the old geopolitics were going to be gone forever. So, next slide. Un uh, unfortunately, that isn't what happened. And we find ourselves in a world in which the networks that uh, weave the world together have suddenly become tools of economic coercion. And we see this in the way that, for example, uh, Japan and uh, uh, South Korea fought over chemicals. We see this in the way that the United States is using uh, various bottlenecks in the world technological system to try and uh, trap uh, Huawei. We also see it in the way that sanctions are used by the United States, and in particular, the way in which secondary sanctions have become a tool through which the United States has turned the world financial system into a means of both gathering information and coercing others, uh, uh, businesses uh, in third jurisdictions to do isolating uh, actors uh, businesses are indeed entire states from the global financial network in pursuit of its strategic aims and objectives. Next slide. So we think about this in terms of weaponized interdependence, and our ideas here are pretty straightforward. All of this is because the webs of network people like Friedman thought were going to unite the world together, bring the world together into global unity, turn out to have their topology. That is, that they have a specific kind of shape. And they have a shape which tends to centralize exchange uh, within particular nodes of the network. And this generates force of power for certain states. If you are a state that is capable of taking one of these nodes and forcing it effectively to do your will, then you can exercise a new and uh, more or less unparalleled form of global power against other economies in um, sort of pursuit of your own strategic objectives. And this is something that the United States has done. This is something that China is seeking to do in its own way. And this is something that we argue in our work presents a crucial challenge for European policymakers. European policymakers really need to understand this world that they are living in. 
they are living in a world where globalization is not how we used to think about it. Globalization is asymmetric, which is to say that these global networks that we describe permeate through all of our economies. And at the same time, they also, as we say, have these central nodes. And many of these central nodes, thanks to accidents of history, are located in places that uh, the United States has influence over. And here we give an example of a very trivial network, which gives you some idea of how this works. This is an airline uh, uh, routing system, uh, in particular Delta Airlines. And you see how it is that if you want to get from, say, Acapulco to Boston, you're almost certainly going to have to travel through Atlanta, which is the hub in a Delta system. And so what we are arguing is that these global networks, networks like the uh, global financial messaging system, networks like indeed the internet itself, that they turn out to have these centralized hubs. And if you are a state that is able to control the centralized hub, you are able to uh, control much of what everything on the network as a whole, you are able to see what is happening, which is what we call the panopticon effect, which is uh, effectively that you are like uh, in uh, Jeremy Bentham or Michel Foucault's work, you are uh, like this uh, actor at the center of a prison where every cell is open to you. You can gather information because you're a dip into the information flows at this central node. And uh, this gives you an unparalleled degree of strategic insight into what adversaries and allies are doing. And in addition to the panopticon effect, there is another effect that we have dubbed the uh, choke point effect, which is that in addition to just uh, looking to see what other actors are doing, you can also effectively weaponize the network against them by uh, turning effectively the network into something that is uh, inaccessible to them if you're able to control the node. And so this effectively is uh, what the United States, for example, has done with secondary sanctions uh, when it sought to deny uh, Iran access to the entire global financial system. That is something that probably would not have been possible 30 or 40 years ago when we had a much less efficient financial system, but also a financial system that wasn't centralized in these ways that the United States was able to find these global uh, choke points, these chokeholds which it was able to use to uh, coerce uh, both uh, uh, allies and banks uh, to, uh, to, to effectively deny Iran access to the system. In the first round, this was done uh, with the cooperation of the European Union, of course, but then under Trump, uh, you saw Trump seeking to do it uh, over the uh, direct and vociferous objections of uh, uh, European states and others in the JCPOA who uh, effectively were trying to hold to an agreement that the uh, United States had brokered and then abandoned. Okay, now it is over to Abe. So let me just, I'm gonna raise a, 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 a few kind of challenges that this um, new world poses to European policymakers. Uh, so if international networks are a new form or a channel for state coercion, then what do European policymakers need to do to prepare themselves? Um, and the first ar uh, thing that we argue is that it's not just about the structure of the networks, you know, that there are these centralized institutional or these centralized uh, hubs, but you also need the institutions that can then defend and also project that type of power. And so here, you know, like in the United States, a lot of uh, this is done by OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, and it has the expertise and the resources to leverage these types of economic institutions for uh, global influence and coercion. And in the European side, you know, I think that is one of the things that the coercion instrument is trying to address, but it is a problem that there isn't a pan-European set of institutions that can really control these networks. And I, we just put up the, um, you know, the special purpose vehicle uh, that the European Union set up to deal with Iran. And for us, that's kind of like a test experiment of you know, a way to think about how could we create the institutional capacity at uh, the European level in the form of INSTEX uh, to start to experiment with these things. But in order to really do this, I think at a broad level and both to defend and project this type of power, you need more institutional competence at the European level. Uh, the second point is, you know, this is a perennial problem for the European Union, but it's, it's, it's about preference alignment or preference coherence. And so it's not just about having the institutions to leverage the networks, but to also agree how to do it. So if you take the case of Nord Stream 2, you know, there was a considerable amount of internal preference, you know, uh, controversy amongst the member states. Similarly, if you think of China right now and 5G networks, you know, it's another case where you, you, don't, you don't have a common position 
And so even if you had the institutions that could address this issue, you still have a lot of you know, bickering within the member states. And so we think that this is of course really important if you're gonna address this type of course of power. Uh, the third thing we wanna raise is, is that uh, you know, for us, the channel through which this type of coercion happens is firms. So you know, the, the way the US exerts influence on Iran, it's through Deutsche Bank. And so you really need to think about the political risk that these firms face and how to manage that. Uh, and you know, it could, it's, it's everything from trying to protect the firms themselves, but also thinking about the, you know, kind of the business strategies that these firms produce. You know, when should they try to uh, shield themselves from different types of coercion, but also when should they lobby directly in the United States to protect themselves or you know, in China, that maybe the target or the channel for protection is not their home firms, but uh, the potential sender countries. Uh, the, the last point that I wanna make is just about that we need to create a world where there are a set of rules of the road for this type of coercion. You know, it, uh, Henry and I have a piece in Foreign Affairs where we talk about a world of chain globalization. Uh, we're not, we don't believe that decoupling is really the way out of these problems, but rather we need to come up with a set of principles about, you know, what is dangerous in this world? When are we likely to get escalation or miscalculation? Um, and, you know, I think you can see the controversy around 5G as a really good example about what happens when you let loose these types of new weapons, but you don't have a playbook in order to manage them. It's a place where China is uh, trying to create a new hub around its technology. And of course, for the United States, that's extremely provocative. Um, and I think the kind of tensions that have arisen is because the actors don't fully understand what they're doing, both in terms of why it might be provocative, but also how to respond. And so in the piece, we kind of draw an analogy to um, when nuclear weapons were created in the late 1940s. You know, the United States and the Soviet Union, they realized there were new weapons, but there wasn't a playbook yet of how to use them. And so uh, academics, physicists, political scientists, you know, they had to come up with the ideas like mutually assured destruction and then propagate them and then create a world that could be more safe with these new coercive tools in play. Um, so we'll just conclude uh, is you know, to, to stress the key points of the argument. First is that economic networks are vulnerable to state control. They're not just uh, a source of um, you know, pacification or uh, cooperation. That in many cases, you know, efficiency has been stressed as the main goal of globalization. But I think what our argument is suggests is that it has to be rebalanced uh, with security interests. And so you need to think about a world that's resilient as well as efficient. Uh, and the, the final uh, point is just that we need a new map. We need a new strategic rule book to think about how should actors uh, you know, interact with each other in a world where economic networks are not just uh, sources for win-win and economic gain, but also choke points and potential surveillance tools. Thanks a lot, Henry and Abby, and also for being so disciplined. Uh, I think that you provide us with, with a great vocabulary uh, and we maybe need to add a glossary to this uh, to this uh, event so that people remember how to how to talk about chalk points uh, panopticon hubs uh, networks uh, and chained globalization um, uh, Erika you've been analyzing sanctions and sanctions policy for for many years could you perhaps tell us a little bit how how that that instrument fits in the in the uh, in this phenomenon of economic coercion, to what extent this is uh, used from, from the US to China to Europe, and how does uh, uh, Europe compare to others on this front, also in terms of uh, whether we can use it in this, in this new power struggle? Sure, thank you, Pavel, and thank you very much to ECFR for this very kind invitation to uh, join you today and to the, um, the two esteemed panelists whose uh, presentation I found extremely interesting. So I would say that, um, I don't know how many of you here would agree with me, but we're reaching something of a crisis point on global sanctions practice. What's clear is that it's a favored tool and it's gonna remain that way. There are more and more countries around the world adopting um, these measures. Um, while there's a, a kind of stagnation um, or stabilization in the UN framework with regard to adoption of new sanctions regimes, what we see is that there are more and more um, countries and regional organizations around the world adopting sanctions um, for a variety of different foreign and security um, policy objectives. Um, 
And there's a good reason for this. Often sanctions are the only option on the table um, be between the so-called war and words. Um, often they're more desirable than other approaches or that they're simply the, the, the other um, avenues have reached their limits. Um, what we see in this unprecedented rise around the world is not only that the breadth of sanctions, um, the types of purposes that they're seeking to tackle are growing. Um, we also see um, new countries starting to adopt them around the world. Um, the very high profile cases, of course, of China and Russia. Though I would also say they've been using sanctions by other names for um, a, a number of years now. And this is something I've explored in a book chapter with Charlotte Boussillon, who's actually with us here today as well. Um, the other really important thing to, to keep in mind is that sanctions are today in place alongside a whole host of other regulations. We have counter-terrorism listings, export controls, anti-money laundering regulations, um, others seeking the combating and financing of terrorism and so on. So it's a really complicated um, um, and, and increasingly confusing compliance environment for businesses, NGOs and so on. Um, what we see, therefore, is a knock-on effect, and, and the earlier speakers alluded to this already. Um, we're seeing an increasing global problem that's termed de-risking. You may have also heard about it, referred to as over-compliance or the chilling effect. Now, this is where principally banks and financial institutions have become increasingly wary of engaging with particularly heavily sanctioned countries. Um, if we take the example of North Korea, for example, there are no remaining banking channels into that country. If we take the, the example of Syria, there are four to five remaining channels at last count on a different project that I'm working on. And we may be facing the extremely worrying situation in the year or two to come where there may be uh, once again, a complete isolation of the country from the uh, traditional banking network. Um, this of course poses huge amount of um, problems, not only economic ones, but also political with regard to um, heightening migration pressures and so on. Um, and the humanitarian impacts, therefore, on ordinary people are accentuated. Um, this has been highlighted as a global crisis by the likes of the IMF, the World Bank, the G20, Financial Action Task Service, and so on. Um, so what we, what we come down to here is that there are a number of factors driving this, but print, first and foremost, the, the, um, the shifts in US sanctions practice in recent years have been particularly problematic. The extraterritoriality on certain sanctions regimes, the global reach of the US dollar, um, the fact that the dollar ha uh, tends to pass through most correspondent banking relationships. Um, and all of this was broadened, of course, under the Trump administration through the maximum pressure campaign. What we saw here um, is with the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, when it was agreed and uh, implemented, what we saw is that European companies and others around the world remained wary to go back into Iran. And this is really problematic because if we look at that in other sanction cases, what we see is that why would a target comply with the sanctions that are in place if they don't see some form of reward afterwards? It's not just about the lifting of the sanctions, it's about resumption of normalized um, diplomatic relations and also normalized trade um, relationships. So this poses a really um, big challenge in terms of incentivization of other targets around the world. Um, it's a big deal for the EU because the EU has tended to follow the US's lead on most sanctions with the exception of um, Cuba, with the exception recently of Venezuela. It tends to follow very closely what the US is do, doing around the world in its autonomous sanction practice. And these are, the, these are the sanctions that supplement UN measures and those that are imposed completely um, separately. Um, so this is, this is first and foremost as a close ally, it poses really big political diplomatic um, challenges. And then of course, also those that we've been talking about the, on the commercial and economic side and in terms of sovereignty questions as well. Um, companies and NGOs are finding themselves at the crossing point of various legal systems, of course. Not only are they having to adhere to their own domestic, so if we think about European companies or even NGOs as well, they're having to adhere to their own domestic legislation and those of the EU. But then they're also having to think about what the US uh, legislation means for them. And now also there are Chinese um, legal considerations. And then on top of this, they'll be thinking about, um, particularly in the case of NGOs and other um, humanitarian organizations, they need to comply with international humanitarian law, human rights law. Um, when it comes to banks and financial institutions, there's commercial law and banking law to take into account. And all of these come together in, in, a, in a worrying and novel way um, in light of, uh, of the, the topics that we're talking about today. The final point I'd like to make is this poses something of a risk to the future 
um, efficacy and legitimacy of, of, I would say, all sanctions in place, particularly those of the US, but also those of the EU. And I think it even translates as a risk to the UN, because ultimately, uh, if the legitimacy of sanctions is compromised, it will leave um, uh, a smaller toolbox available to policymakers in t tackling some of the world's most protracted crises. Um, and uh, as we see it at the moment, it looks set to stay as a preferred instrument of foreign and security policy. So I think this particular question needs to um, really warrant some very serious thinking. Thanks a lot, uh, Erika. I will move directly to Jonathan asking uh, whether there is a gap in, uh, it's a rhetorical question, whether there is a gap uh, in Europe's differences uh, uh, towards economic coercion and whether there are any plans uh, to, to tackle that gap. Thanks, Pavel, and hello, everyone. Um, my previous speakers have, have um, talked about yeah, the analysis and the, uh, and the sort of um, the world that we, that we live in. And, um, uh, and, and what, we've, what we've noticed was that Europe was, was sort of, there was a sense of optionslosigkeit, this German word for optionlessness, no, no option to, um, to really react when, when, they, when Europeans were confronted with extraterritorial sanctions, but also punitive tariffs and so forth under the Trump administration, but also increasingly um, uh, uh, by China and other actors, um, Russia threatening, or, or there, was, there were worries just recently about Russia threatening similar measures on the Czech Republic, for example, uh, over, over in the recent tensions over, um, uh, over explosions in 2014, which, uh, which the Czech government uh, attributes to, um, to, to the Russian military intelligence service. And um, and this options optionlessness was um, was particularly grave because of what what Henry and, and Abe have um, have have talked about the, the fact that there is no pan European institution no EU OFAC and it's and it's not so much in sight either um, and um, uh, and on the other hand there was no rule book as as Henry and Abe have said and and that of course would be the ideal uh, um, situation that Europeans would like that there is an international regime so but but with what what Trump Trump uh, Trump's sanctions and China's actions increasing actions have have done is I think uh, given Europeans a sense that there may be a need for defensive tools um, and for closing a gap and and we've we've identified um, as part of a uh, work of with a task force with high level um, uh, public officials but also private sector representatives um, uh, what we see is a gap. Uh, when, especially when it comes to um, to economic coercion, that ideally, from a third country point of view, is is designed in in a certain way, and that is uh, that it comes at Europe with speed, where a WTO dispute resolution uh, uh, takes a long time, and the, the, the political situation that uh, uh, that economic coercion is is trying to um, influence is already over by the time we have a WTO, or you know, the parts of the rule book and the institutions have been able to respond to. Um, that oftentimes you see gray zone tools that uh, that don't that may even be WTO compliant, but they in a sit in a specific situation they're being used uh, in ways that um, uh, uh, that simply um, are coercive and are a clear reaction to to a policy stance taken. So the best example for this for this is um, uh, Australia's um, or China's use of anti-dumping measures against Australia. Australia has many more anti-dumping measures in place than. Uh, uh, against China than vice versa, but uh, they came right after um, uh, uh, China called for an, in, for, an, for an independent inquiry into, into the pandemic outbreak in, in Wuhan. And, um, and, uh, and, and this gap of gray zone tool speed and, and, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and measures that, that Europe can deal with is um, is something that the EU seems to be uh, trying to close now. So there, you, what we can see is um, on defensive tools that the European Commission is currently working on an anti-coercion instrument, uh, which uh, from our point of view would be a major step because it would be a, would allow um, uh, the EU to take countermeasures in the case of coercive action against European governments and or or, or the EU as a whole. But uh, but, but we're, um, it's based on. By a violation of state sovereignty, and um, and uh, but there there are specific and, and big problems, of course, when you think of when you think of taking countermeasures, not just risks of tit for tat escalations and and so forth that um, uh, that you that Europeans would like to avoid, but um, but uh, 
but there's what we're struggling with because of the institutional framework that um, that uh, Abe and Henry have have pointed out is um, is coming up with countermeasures that are both effective and credible. And if uh, it, let's take effective first, if we uh, a countermeasure that if you want to establish a deterrent, uh, which which this defensive tool um, would do, um, uh, you want to be sure that the countermeasures you can you can uh, take actually have an effect and, and make think China twice if uh, in a certain situation uh, uh, where, where it wants to act coercively. Uh, but at the same time, you have to make it credible that you can actually use them. And the EU um, can make it very credible to use tariffs, counter tariffs um, uh, and, and uh, import curves, investment restrictions probably um, on the EU level as a countermeasure and, and deterrent. But it struggles to make it very credible that it can that that it can react with counter sanctions, with uh, export controls, with uh, with uh, divestment from certain areas, and especially when we think of China, one of the one of the main lessons probably of the maximum pressure campaign is that tariffs might not be something that that uh, impress the Chinese government and make it change course. Uh, that in any case um, uh, did not quite succeed in in the in the Trump case in in, in the the case of Trump policy. So, so coming up with the right kind of toolbox under this instrument will be a major challenge. And another one is, and just just um, uh, uh, off of what um, what Henry and Abe said, uh, these network forms of economic coercion oftentimes work through through companies, as as Abe and Henry have, have told us. And um, and the current approach that we see may uh, to the anti-coercion instrument may actually target. Uh, coercion against public entities and may not sufficiently cover um, uh, uh, forms of coercion that that work on private entities, um, for example, Chinese extraterritorial export controls and so forth. So the question is um, uh, whether one needs to enlarge it, or in any case, there are big questions that remain on Europe's track uh, for for more um, uh, resilience and tools. And of course, the anti-coercion instrument can can't be the only tool. Uh, what we think um, uh, as part of our work is increasingly that the EU may need, we won't, won't get to an EU OFAC, but um, may need an EU resilience office, which at least uh, centralizes capacity of analysis, of uh, vulnerability assessments, of, um, uh, uh, of coordination of countermeasures and, and other ac uh, actions across DGs in the European Commission. And, um, and also provides uh, a, an institution that where private sector actors can flag uh, instances of coercion, uh, because at the moment uh, they may not always have an incentive to do so for various uh, understandable reasons. And if you have a semi-independent um, uh, uh, institution where, where they can do that, they may they may more easily do that do so. Um, I think I'll leave it here. But that's the sort of way on uh, on which uh, the direction that Europe is seems to be going. Um, many questions still open, but. Um, but, uh, but also some progress. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. And uh, I encourage everyone to put your questions in the chat box. I, I see that some questions are already coming. Let me, but let me abuse also my privilege of, of moderating at this and, and ask just two questions. And uh, the best will be to, uh, to Henry. Uh, so you, you have heard from, from uh, Jonathan that there is a couple of initiatives being pursued right now in the in the EU with the anti coercion instrument, a possible reform of the blocking statute, uh, our idea of, of creating a, a resilience office uh, to, to, to ensure better coordination of that all. Um, so feel free to comment on the, those ideas, but I would also be happy to hear from you uh, from a broader perspective. Uh, do you think that what, what Europe's goal should actually be? And I ask this question as, as international idealists, uh, which will be clear uh, once I ask it. So I, I just want to know whether the EU should, from your point of view, become more like the US and China, more skillful in the art of, of weaponized interdependence, an actor which has those networks, which can uh, use those uh, chalk points effects, etc. Or should we rather, uh, if there is such, such a dilemma, aim at um, establishing an international framework in which the economic coercion would be neutralized, in which the US and China would not be able uh, to weaponize the economic interdependence? I, so I think that uh, the U European Union needs to find a 
course, which is neither of those courses. And I think, first of all, the United States, the United States has established this kind of global dominance. And I don't think that the European Union is going to be successful in creating a counter dominance. For that matter, I don't think that China is going to be particularly successful either. What it has been doing, what it has been weaponizing is its domestic economy. And that means that sometimes it is cutting off to uh, spite its face, to use a, a, a phrase from my native Ireland, uh, you know, that it's effectively hurting itself in the pursuit of, 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 of hurting others in ways that isn't going to be sustainable or effective over the longer term. So I think that some of what the EU has to do is uh, what Abe was describing, that if, if it is to act on a... Uh, on a multilateral level, it has to recognize that the genie isn't going to be put back into the bottle, that the best that you can do is to contain and to normalize these kinds of pressures rather than to eliminate them uh, completely. So I don't think we're going to be going back to that kind of multilateral world where this stuff didn't really happen. It always did happen to some degree. Uh, I think what we're going to be going to at best is a world in which you can manage it through some kind of, uh, to, through some kind of a shared set of rules of the road. But in addition to that, I think that Europe should be doing, you know, its strategic goal here should be trying to preserve a high level of integration with the global economy. This is something that is incredibly important to it. So preserve means to protect itself, I think, much more than the, the means to, uh, you know, to act like the United States or like, the, uh, like China, like a hegemon in the uh, making, that it needs to protect itself as best as possible, which may, however, mean that the, the necessity to develop some coercive tools. So how do I think that it does this? First of all, as Jonathan says, you're sort of building up some kind of an anti-coercion capacity is a key step towards this. But also, as Jonathan said, it isn't the only that a Europe should be doing. It should be uh, participating on the multilateral level along the lines that uh, Abe would suggest, along the lines that you have uh, also referred to. It should be focusing on building up alternative payment networks and the like that are less vulnerable to coercion. I think that the role of a digital euro might be particularly interesting here. It is much harder for the United States to go after uh, the, uh, you know, than it is uh, individual banks for some of the reasons that Erica has uh, laid out so eloquently. It needs to focus on uh, building up credible means of retaliation for uh, deterrent purposes, not only including the anti-coercion, but also some direct coercive capacity of its own, which it probably needs to uh, deploy uh, in, uh, when necessary to protect its interests, as we saw most recently. Uh, airplane hijacking, there is an important role for EU coercion, and that has to be, you know, that has to. And this is going to require some real change. I think that the big lesson that Europe should take from Abe's uh, work, if we are is that I, we are going to have to see a substantial building up of institutional capacities at the end level. And the fundamental lesson that I think that Abe and I have is that we now live in a world, it used to be, we used to live in a world which was pretty good for all independent states because they could outsource a lot of governance to the international market and not have to worry about rules and regulations. Now we live in a world where rules and regulations have become weaponized. And that means that you need to have two things. You need to have market scale and you need to have powerful institutions and you need to be able to combine the two together. And European Union member states are not going to be able to do this effectively on their own, even if they have the power of the European Union's market in them and they need su uh, sufficient institutional capacity to uh, leverage that power in defense of Europe. Uh, so I think that the days of stealing v of vetoes, um, sort of uh, being san you know, vetoes on sanctions by one member state, Hungary or whoever, those to come to a very rapid close. Equally, the days in which uh, we had uh, small island states like uh, Malta or Cyprus, effectively uh, dependent upon uh, oligarchs from uh, offshore to uh, you know, sort of in ways which uh, in ways which uh, compromise the um, sort of the compromise their banking systems. I think that that has to come to a rapid close. The European needs to build up sufficient internal capacity to uh, discipline its member states when they're behaving in ways that are uh, really um, sort of cutting against the collective interest. And uh, those, those uh, capacities are also going to be uh, sufficient, I think, to allow it to uh, act much more uh, coherently as an international actor as well. And of course, it's very easy for Abe and I as outsiders to come in and to say that uh, you know, we are not um, sort of uh, living in the European Union system day by, by day. 
Uh, there obviously is a lot of messy and difficult politics that goes along with it. The fundamental measure up to if it is not going to be a has been and if it is not going to be left by the wayside as other states are out in a uh, new uh, competition over coercion. Thanks a lot, Henry. It indeed sounded very easy uh, from your words, but, but in practice might be a little bit more difficult. I wonder, and this will be my short question to, to Abby, uh, whether the new transatlantic uh, uh, moment of, of love uh, uh, means that Europe's tasks are getting uh, much easier or just a little bit easier or not at all, not easier at all because as someone has put in the chat uh, from what you are saying it sounded as if uh, the US rather than China was the major problem for, for, for Europeans so let me just emphasize a few different things which I think then shed light on how Europe should think about China versus the United States so in our world private actor networks, global firms, they're the channel of power. And in order to break up that power or to reduce your exposure, the real key is to create duopolies, not be completely dependent on one country's firms or their economic infrastructures. Because once you are dependent on those economic infrastructures, you have very few alternatives. And so then the question is whose preferences could be in contrast to your preferences. So who's, who, what firms are out there? Are you choosing between the United States or, you, or China or your own? And then you know, where, which governments are likely to create conflict with you over time? And so you know, for a long time, the issue was US firms were great and the preferences were very similar between the United States and Europe. And so Europe was happy to bandwagon with the United States because the firms were doing good things. They were providing services that people wanted. So I think the, um, you know, that question of preference divergence between the United States and Europe, I don't see it going so far as what we potentially would have between the US and, or sorry, uh, Europe and China. So I think, you know, we were in a meeting not that long ago where it was like, you know, the US is annoying, China's worrying, you know, and, and I think that that's kind of a, a way to capture these types of ideas is, but the bigger question is your dependence and your vulnerability. And that's where I think it's not just about institutions, that Europe needs to create institutions. It needs to reframe its belief in what economic markets are. Because I think in, in Europe, the driving emphasis is economic markets are about openness. That's the goal. Openness, liberalization, we need more of that. But we have to view these markets also as a source of vulnerability. It goes all the way back to Hamilton. Yeah, I mean, not to play some music from my kids' playlist, but you know, it's the idea that economic markets are devoid of power should, you know, it, it needs to be a wake-up call. And there I would just go back to Europe's involvement with the internal market. You know, the internal market is a strategic asset. It is a way to combat these issues. You can think about coercion instruments and all these, but if you got the internal market commissioner to believe that the internal market itself and integration was not just about openness for economic concerns, uh, but also for strategic concerns, you know, promoting European firms was not just to promote economic benefits, but it also, it creates these duopolies, these places where the, Europe is not just dependent on either Chinese firms or uh, US firms. And just if you take 5G, you know, it's a, it's a great example where um, the European Commission has not been able to, you know, invest a tremendous amount of money in lifting up Nokia and Ericsson as alternatives to a Huawei. And that's just, you know, that's silly. The internal market, the whole project should be behind, you, here are these European firms that are not just economically useful, but they're strategically useful. And so that's another way to think about, or you know, it's like, the focus should not just be on how do we fight the countries, China or the United States, but how do we lift up our firms? And by lifting up our firms, we will reduce our own vulnerability. Sure, but uh, uh, given the transatlantic context, uh, one cannot avoid asking a question whether Europe should still expect extraterritorial sanctions from the US. Is, is this era of... of, of uh, uh, well, I, I think that that's all the countries do that. It, it, it's, it's not a, like, if you think about the European Union in the context of data privacy, it uses extraterritorial power. It says any company in the world has to play by European rules when it comes to data privacy. If you look at aviation rules about CO2 emissions, Europe says, 
It's just that the place where the U Europe uses extraterritorial power is the internal market. And I would argue it's because it has the institutions in the internal market to do that. And it doesn't have the institutions in its foreign policy apparatus to do that. And so, you know, it could easily transfer those internal market views to those other areas. I think a lot of times we say, oh, China's not playing by the rules because they're making all these demands about stuff. Well, we all make those demands when we have the political consensus and the institutional capacity to do it. And so I don't, I think it's, it's a, we'll never be able to get rid of extraterritorial uh, applications from these powerful markets. You know, the US, China, Europe, their markets are too big and they get to set rules. It's just the question of, will they have the political will and the institutions to do it? Which, and I, I will now direct my question to Erika, uh, which means that uh, extraterritorial sanctions are here to stay. What, what, what Europe's approach should be? Is, uh, is it realistic to expect that, that uh, Europe could become uh, more resilient to, to, to the use of sanctions by other actors? Should we become like, like them or, or, or is, this, is, there, is there any other course of action? Well, thank you. I think um, the, that question has partly been answered very um, eloquently already by the, the other two panelists. Um, I, would, I would tend to agree, though, that <clears throat> particularly with regard to the US side of the house, um, the, the, there's potentially a form of opportunity at the moment, of course, with the election of um, the Biden administration and the fact that they're currently undergoing a review into the future of um, US sanctions policy. So where I'm rather pessimistic like the other speakers as to whether this will get anywhere, I think uh, that that should certainly be a big part of the um, approach at the moment. Um, what we what we know is that um, the, the US depends rather heavily on the EU in the implementation of certain sanctions regimes. If we look at the case of Russia, for example, President, uh, former President Obama said that really it was all about the European sanctions. Um, and if they weren't working together, the, it wouldn't be worth much, something to that effect. So I think that's, a, that's something really that's really important to keep in mind. And I think I'm also very interested in the role that could be played by um, alternative financial payment mechanisms as well. Um, I think that with regard to cryptocurrencies, crypto assets in general, I think this is, is probably an unlikely um, route that will be particularly beneficial because of course they can be still subject to sanctions. Um, in the case of Venezuela, for example, the Petro, the Venezuelan cryptocurrency, as well as any other um, current or future crypto asset is subject to US sanctions. And this, is, uh, this can easily happen with uh, various other countries around the world, of course. But where I think is more promising is the role of digital currencies by central banks. And of course, pretty much every central bank around the world is looking into this question at the moment, um, including the, um, in the European context. Um, so those are, that's the, that, those are the two areas that I think um, are most interesting there. On the Chinese front, <clears throat> I think it's still, it's, it's still rather early days to say what the implications of the new Chinese legislation will be. Um, we don't know quite yet how often the um, Chinese equivalent of the blocking statute will be uh, and, and associated legislation will be used, um, how aggressively um, against which targets and so on. But I think um, it certainly uh, marks uh, a new um, um, a new chapter in this subject that, that that is going to probably change rather rapidly in the coming years. Thanks. Um, in, in the chat, there is a lively discussion uh, between uh, involving Antonius de Vries, who is uh, among the original authors of the use blocking statutes, and and uh, Hannes Svoboda. Uh, an Austrian uh, member of European uh, Parliament on, uh, on on whether Europe can create a, an equivalent to OFAC and why not, uh, and uh, pointing out to the fact that creating a resilient economy in Europe is also an important defense towards uh, towards economic uh, coercion. And uh, I think it's it, it's unquestionable um, uh, here. Let me um, I, I encourage uh, uh, others to to put questions in the chat uh, uh, as well. Uh, but I believe uh, many of you would like to react to, to what has already been sent, uh, said. And uh, Jonathan, I'm looking particularly at, uh, at you at, and whether, uh, based on what we have heard, you, you, you have a view on when, what could actually be, uh, where, where could Europe have an area uh, where it could have a leverage over others? Um, so uh, what instruments could actually, given also the, the complicated structure uh, of the EU, what, what could actually 
uh, where is the area where, where we could improve our defenses uh, easiest and be most credible and effective in defending ourselves. Right. Um, so the um, if you're talking about concrete countermeasures, um, I think I think the um, it, it really depends on on the third country um, that we're talking about, and it will depend on the concrete vulnerability assessment that the commission conducts. And we've actually seen that um, uh, the commission or the EU of, overall uh, conducts uh, in in taking countermeasures. But what we've seen. In um, in uh, when we've seen the counter tariffs, counter you know trade defenses uh, being used um, uh, in uh, against Trump administration, uh, is that Europe can actually is actually pretty good at that and can can identify and 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 vulnerabilities of third countries and so forth. The the problem is the institutional design, as always, and as we've been saying, uh, and others have been saying in, in this uh, uh, conversation uh, much longer, that if if it's not about a tariff or not about a, an, an investment restriction, um, uh, it, things may be much more difficult to do because you need unanimity as as, as things stand, or you need uh, member states to work together as as part of a coalition of the willing, in theory at least. Um, if you think. Um, if you think of counter sanctions, um, uh, that's not something the EU wants to do because it typically just wants to uh, wants to stay uh, united on its sanctions policy. So, so that's th those are areas. That the problem is that in those areas that are not credible, you you oftentimes um, or you you may find uh, um, leverage or levers that um, that are more effective than counter tariffs. And um, and if you think. Um, what what is China most interested in? It might be tax transfers in certain areas. Still, it might be um, it might be uh, uh, access to certain technologies. Um, and we've seen the U.S. Uh, use that exactly um, those hubs um, and restricting act access to those. Those might be things that Europe could contemplate. But then we're possibly in the area of export controls or or so. And and the decision making is is not centralized in, in Brussels. Thanks a lot. I, I'm asking other questions from the chat uh, and looking now mostly to Henry and Abby. Uh, there is a question about uh, the technological uh, and uh, strategic um, industrial sectors beyond 5G and cryptocurrencies. What other uh, sectors could reveal of strategic interest of the EU uh, in, in the coming future as concerns uh, economic coercion? And I think that a, a related question, which, which I would ask, uh, you is is how do we actually identify and measure those networks in which uh, some countries rather than others uh, have a control over a hub uh, in a network that as you say has a type, type uh, typology well let me answer the second of those questions uh, which has a very short answer with incredible difficulty and this is a general problem. It is a problem in the United States. It is a problem for Europe. It is a problem for everybody. And really, this is a story of how globalization has worked. And globalization really has involved, first of all, these uh, decisions which turn to be incredibly strategically important, especially when you come, for example, to things like supply chains being put out to the private sector. And secondly, the private sector not very often having a good idea itself of uh, what the decisions it, it is making and what vulnerabilities it is creating. So if you think about supply chains, you know, typically a big company will have a good idea of who its suppliers are. It may have some idea of the suppliers to those suppliers. But once you get maybe three le levels down to sub-suppliers and sub-suppliers and sub-suppliers, you begin to get to a point where nobody knows what is going on. And sometimes that can create some uh, pretty important uh, strategic uh, strategic vulnerabilities. And this is something we're seeing, of course, as a result of coronavirus, which is not a design shock, but is a random shock, which uh, suddenly exposed a, uh, you know, some pretty substantial uh, dependencies and vulnerabilities in the system where you realize suddenly that when one company goes offline because it is not uh, able to get its workers in, suddenly a lot of uh, uh, repercussions can roll through an entire sector as a result. So this is something that the United States is very clearly trying to uh, figure out ways to, uh, ways to 
build up. It, it wants to build up its knowledge. Uh, it is better off, I think, than the European Union and uh, the, than China, because OFAC has built up a uh, significant amount of expertise, albeit it uh, often, you know, it can occasionally uh, make mistakes. Uh, for example, with the uh, Roussel sanctions had to uh, kind of roll back without saying it was rolling back because it didn't realize what kinds of consequences this was going to have for uh, for Europe and for the European car manufacturing sector. We're going, the United States is trying to think through how to do this. It has a difficulty because of, I think, the hands-off relationship between government and the private sector. European Union probably doesn't have that many hang-ups, or at least not the same, about gathering, uh, gathering uh, this kind of data and information. But uh, where the legal authorities rest, where the uh, possibilities are, that I, you know, that that is a, I think, a, a difficult set of questions. Which uh, there may be discussions. I'm sure that there have to be discussions that are happening in the Commission and in the member states. But uh, what stage those those discussions are, I don't know. And the big problem that I think anybody is going to face that uh, is that knows nobody has a map of exactly what is happening it could be that once you begin to gather some data that machine learning and other kinds of uh, te techniques can um, sort of be used you know sort of a uh, perhaps spectral graph analysis to identify you know, sort of where the clusters are, where the choke points are in ways uh, that become possible once you have a uh, lot of uh, data. But getting that data is a, a difficult political question. Yeah, we need new power maps. I, I agree with that. Uh, so let, let me ask two, two, two final questions because before we go to, to a wrap up. Uh, um, Erika, uh, You've been looking at sanctions also from the, or maybe sometimes mostly from the point of view of, of the original destination, is which is to defend human rights uh, across the world. Do you do you see the the current context in which uh, sanctions and other tools are, are increasingly used for um, economic coercion uh, purposes as as one in which for Europe it may become increasingly difficult to defend human rights uh, internationally and uh, uh, before you answer also i would ask a question to to jonathan given the german elections which are happening uh, 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 this year do you believe that they will make they should make it easier for europe to discuss uh, economic coercion or do they have no 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 impact on that process Okay, well, thank you for that, that really good question. Um, I would say that you're right, across the board, um, sanctions are have been traditionally used to tackle human rights issues, along with a whole host of other matters, of course, um, but increasingly they're coming hand in hand with human rights implications. And I think um, you're right in saying that the economic coercive aspect of some certain sanctions regimes brings um, into the four some really important human rights questions but not only that I would say it's more on the other side of the house also in terms of international humanitarian law um, in the UN context it's the same kind of double-edged sword there's there's a number of UN sanctions regimes that are now being used to tackle quite a breaches of IHL but at the same time um, the blockages that are being caused by um, some of these more coercive aspects of sanctions uh, are increasingly um, hindering the activities of humanitarian operations, of healthcare workers. And it's been particularly since the pandemic that the, the, some of these issues have really been put under the spotlight. And it's led to a, a whole host of um, world leaders and um, those of international organizations as well to um, call on the US government in particular, but also the international community to give much closer thought to um, how some of these issues can be um, resolved and I think something that's missing from the debates that I'm normally involved in is this what we're talking about today so I would be very interested to see what would happen if we brought these two worlds together because essentially we're looking at the same problem but from very different angles and I think it's quite interesting to hear um, when I've been joining some of your meetings the much more um, it's a very different kind of strategic debate to those who are thinking about how to alleviate the humanitarian implications of secondary sanctions and the knock-on effects. Thanks a lot, definitely. This is uh, an area in which many uh, um, silos need to be uh, broken and uh, also discussions need to engage uh, legal experts, economists, political uh, experts and different parts of the European Commission as well when it comes to de developmental tools. Uh, Jonathan, German election. Yeah, you're, you're asking a tough question. I think uh, on German elections, um, 
my, the, what I generally tend to say is everything is possible, but don't expect much to happen. Um, uh, is is the sort of uh, I think outlook on on the German elections. I think we will see one big change, of course, and that's the Green Party entering government. That seems uh, I mean every everyone uh, seems to expect that. And as I said, everything is possible. Even uh, 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 um, the Greens becoming the strongest party. But though I would say that that's a, that would be a surprise. But what that will bring um, uh, is is probably on one hand. Uh, it's certainly, in any case, a, a stronger focus or, or emphasis on European sovereignty. I think the Greens are per, fairly clear on that, um, and uh, and also an emphasis on um, a, a, a tougher stance on China than than uh, possibly you might you might have seen now, uh, particularly when it comes to human rights, and um, that is going to have, I think. Um, and the, the one of the implications of that is that uh, uh, if you look at how China has reacted to a modest uh, uh, listing of four uh, um, officials, uh, Chinese officials by the EU uh, over human rights uh, violations in in Wuhan. Um, if you if if Germany uh, with the green uh, government with a with a more green government uh, pushes for for a tougher action, um, I think um, uh, something one has to think about is the the reaction from the other side. Um, and uh, and and it's been widely asymmetric with economic punishment last time with just four in March when when the EU listed just four officials as I said, and um, and China has been has been sending a quite clear message. So I think that would you know that it would um, uh, be, be 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 ready to retaliate and and even use economic punishment uh, uh, to tougher human rights stances to a closer stance closer stance with the U.S. Uh, if, if the EU took uh, adopted one and so forth, and uh, and that brings us back to the resilience questions and and the question of what do we what do we do if if there's econ if economic coercion tries to um, change uh, uh, the European policy stance and why we might may need instruments um, uh, uh, or in any case. A good strategy to be resilient and um, and, uh, and 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 what to do uh, with the leveraging of the networks and network hubs that Abe and Henry talk about. Thanks a lot. And and from ha what Henry uh, said, I also take that we probably are focusing a lot on instruments that the EU could use, uh, but uh, it's largely about evidence and uh, and the collection of data, understanding of the processes. Uh, where, where, where the main uh, challenge is, and this requires capacity, whether it's uh, located in Brussels or in, in national capitals, simply this, this capacity seems to be missing, as it is missing in, in, in other countries across the world uh, as well. We are approaching the, the, the end, as, as a wrap up, uh, I promise to, to ask you uh, the same question uh, uh, to, to all of you, uh, which is to uh, assess from zero to 10, to what extent you are confident that Europe will be able to, um, to, to create differences uh, towards economic coercion in the, in the next two or three years. So let's start with Henry, Abby, uh, Erika and Jonathan, and then we'll close. Um, anywhere between four to seven, depending on how uh, confident and happy I am on a particular day. I think that I think that the European Union has been very battering uh, ten or fifteen years in a variety of ways. I do think that there is, uh, you know, that there are some interesting changes happening, and that there is at least possibility of the uh, European Union stepping up to the task. That is going to take a transformation, I think, in how the European Union thinks about itself, and uh, not just with respect to sanctions, but also with respect to the relationship between member states and the whole, uh, the uh, need to understand how to deal with us. Uh, Hungary and Poland, which are, uh, you know, which are really I'm sort of stepping outside of the EU consensus on major uh, on major questions, which don't just include uh, sanctions. I think if that if that uh, if that uh, law is uh, broken up, then I think a lot of things become possible. And if not, then I think the European Union is going to muddle along in a uh, in a kind of a frankly a second rate kind of way. Thanks a lot, Abby. Yeah, I would just say kind of, uh, I think it's either a 10 or a zero, you know, is that uh, the EU has unparalleled expertise within the internal market. It actually has the experts and the, the organizational structure to tackle most of these tasks, but that structure is not at all coupled 
to the foreign policy or the security apparatus. And so if it could manage to do that, it's actually better positioned than uh, China or the United States because the, we don't actually have so much focus on our internal economic structures. Uh, but I think right now, there's not a political will or a realization that those things need to happen. And so I think that, uh, you know, you could see something flip on a dime or it could just kind of uh, persist in this kind of middling state. Thanks a lot, Erika. It's getting more difficult, isn't it? <laughs> well, in the interest of some form of balance, I'm going to go for a round of five, I think. Um, I think I actually really agree with what Abe was saying. Um, it's about drawing together all these different areas of expertise and uh, capacities. But of course, that, that challenge is extremely complex and, um, and a formidable one at that as well. Um, I would say that based on my experience, having worked now for many years with the European Commission, um, with a number of European governments as well, including the Swiss government, who does a lot of work on this questions behind the scenes, with regards to um, impacts of some of these, uh, the same drivers, including extraterritorial sanctions, on the humanitarian sphere, what I fear is that we'll see something similar happening uh, um, with regard to um, resilience and so on, which is that the talks are ongoing, there's a lot of individual projects, there's perhaps not enough join up some of the time, and also the um, the reluctance to seen as being too conflictual with the US is a, is a big, um, is a big uh, challenge, I think, and uh, hinders um, work that could be um, a bit more um, uh, Bit more ambitious and I think on the technology front that's a really important one for the EU I would say we've already seen Instex that hasn't really done so much on the Iranian context also the Swiss humanitarian trade agreement there's various efforts at doing at getting around some of these problems um, but I think there's some really interesting studies coming out of the um, GovTech uh, RegTech sphere with regard to how distributed ledger technology such as blockchain could help or, or also other areas of innovation such as know your customer utilities um, big data, machine learning, um, biometrics, and so on. Um, some of these could potentially help in alleviate, uh, or, or basically um, get around some of the, the worst problems that are at play here, and also alleviate some of the pressures on the supply chains that we were talking about earlier. Thank you, Erika. Jonathan, I expect a strong 10 from you. <laughs> I, I am optimistic, and certainly more optimistic than a few years ago. Um, uh, and and uh, and because everyone has already picked a number that so uh, that there's no none left almost for me, um, I think I'm going to go for seven or eight, um, and not justify it very well. So so that you in the interest of time. Thanks a lot, and thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, I, I enjoyed this uh, debate uh, a lot. I hope uh, all the others did uh, so as well. Let me just flag that next week, Jonathan and I will be publishing uh, a policy brief. Uh, discussing the uh, perspectives of, of, of ad uh, adopting an anti-coercion instrument uh, by, by the European Union, risks and opportunities uh, uh, of it. And uh, on the, 20th, the 23rd, which is in uh, less than in week's time, um, we'll have another event with, with Carl Bild and Sabine uh, Weyant uh, uh, discussing the, the details of what, uh, what uh, such an anti-coercion instrument uh, could include. So I'm also happy to invite you for, for that uh, event and hope it will not clash with any of the Euro Cup uh, matches. Uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you uh, in less than a week's time. And thanks a lot to all the uh, speakers today. <laughs>